This is going to be an introduction to the Go language aimed at programmers having at least a basic familiarity with JavaScript. It may also help to have basic familiarity with C, but that is not expected. I'm not going to cover every detail of Go, but I'll hit all the major concepts fairly thoroughly. Go is quite young, first released publicly in late 2009. The primary three authors of the language are Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and Robert Griesemer, all developers at Google. Both Rob Pike and Ken Thompson were previously well known for their involvement in the development of Unix, and Thompson was one of the primary authors of the C language. In many ways, Go is targeted as a successor to C and C++, but Go is a higher level language. Most notably, Go is garbage collected and memory safe. Consequently, unlike C and C++, Go is generally inappropriate for low-level code and very high-performance code, such as in operating systems and graphically intensive games. Where Go excels is in concurrency, thanks to two features, Go routines and channels. Go routines allow us to create many separate threads of execution without the usual overhead, and channels give us a simple mechanism to communicate between our threads and synchronize them. Along with native compilation, these features make Go particularly well-suited for server code, and that is where Go has most commonly been used. Beyond servers, Go is surprisingly well-suited for small scripts that otherwise would be written in Python, Ruby, the shell, or other dynamic languages. Even though Go is statically typed, it largely avoids the burdens usually associated with statically typed languages. Unlike most recent languages, Go is not object-oriented, at least not in the classical sense. Instead of requiring us to define a hierarchy of types in our programs, Go allows us to express ad hoc relationships between types with what are called interfaces. As we'll see, an interface defines a set of methods, and any type that implements all of the methods of an interface is considered to automatically implement that interface as well. The practical result is that Go programmers don't have to worry about building and managing complex type hierarchies. What I most appreciate about Go is that the language stringently avoids complexity in both the rules of the language and in its tool chain. The creators of Go have resisted the usual temptation to pile on more and more features, allowing the users of Go to think about the problems they want to solve instead of wasting time thinking about the language. Just like in JavaScript, variables in Go are declared by var statements. What's different in Go is that we specify a type after the variable name. Here we specify that this variable foo is of type string, and so the Go compiler only allows us to assign strings to foo, not any other kind of value. This is static typing. The programmer must declare a type for every variable, and the compiler then enforces that type. Specifying the types of every variable tends to make our code verbose, but Go allows a variable's type to be left inferred if we initialize the declaration. Here, the compiler infers that foo is a string variable because we initialize it with a string in the declaration. In any subsequent assignments, the compiler requires that we assign only strings to foo, just like if we had explicitly declared the type. As a further convenience, we can leave out the word var if we put a colon before the equal sign. Unlike in JavaScript, variables in Go may not be declared more than once in a scope. Here, the compiler will complain that we are redeclaring foo. To fix this, we should use the colon only in the first assignment. In truth, the compiler needn't be so picky, but the authors of Go didn't want programmers to habitually use colon equals when they only need assignment, because that habit might lead to unintended declarations. Another difference from JavaScript is that control flow constructs like if, else, and loops are each their own scope. Here we declare a variable y inside this if, and so y only exists inside the if. If we move the declaration of y above the if, it now exists both within the if and without. When we declare a variable y both outside the if and also within, then these are two separate variables that just happen to share the same name. Outside the if, y refers to the outer variable. Inside the if, y refers to the inner variable. So here, the call to foo is past the value of the outer y, which was last assigned 5. Aside from strings, Go also has a Boolean type called bool. Bool, of course, has two values, true and false. Where things get complicated is with numbers. In JavaScript, we have just one number type, which is represented as 64-bit floating point, but in Go, we have several different number types with different sizes. For integers, we have four sizes, 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, or 64 bits. For floating point numbers, we have two sizes, 32 bits and 64 bits. If you don't understand the distinction between integers and floating point, or if you don't understand the significance of the number of bits, you should watch my earlier video called Numbers as Bits. The short explanation is that integers represent only whole numbers, while floating point values have a fractional component, like 3.47. The more bits to represent the number, the larger the range of possible values. 
For example, an 8-bit integer can only represent the numbers negative 128 up to positive 127, but a 16-bit integer can represent the values from negative 32,768 up to positive 32,767. Go also has unsigned integer types, which represent only positive values, including 0. For example, an 8-bit unsigned integer can represent integers from 0 up to positive 255. Complex numbers, you may remember from math class, are the sum of two components, one of which is imaginary. In Go, these two parts are represented as two floating-point numbers. So a complex 64 is made up of two 32-bit floating-point numbers, and a complex 128 is made up of two 64-bit floating-point numbers. You won't need complex numbers unless you do certain kinds of mathematics, but I mention them here for completeness. Finally, we have these five types, which are actually equivalent to other existing types. A plain int is equivalent to either an int32 or an int64. On 32-bit platforms, 32-bit integers tend to be more efficient to use, but on 64-bit platforms, 64-bit integers tend to be more efficient, so the size of an int depends upon the platform for which we're compiling. Unless you have good reason to use some other type, int should be your default choice to represent a number. uint ptr, as in unsigned integer pointer, is an unsigned integer type that is large enough to store a memory address. Memory addresses vary in size between platforms, so the size of uint ptr depends upon which platform we're compiling for. The byte type is merely an alias for uint8, and the rune type is merely an alias for int32. A byte, of course, is 8 bits, and rune is a unicode term for a single character. These aliases exist simply to make the intent of some code more clear. Now, you may be wondering what happens when the results of number operations produce values too big or too small for the number type range. Well, in general, the result will wrap around. For example, the max value of a uint8 is 255, and so if we add 1 to 255, the value overflows to 0. And if we add 3 to 255, the value overflows to 2. Conversely, if we subtract 1 from the smallest uint8 value, which is 0, we get underflow to 255. If we subtract 10 from 4, we get underflow to 250. The same thing happens for all integer types, just with different min and max values. For an int 16, for example, we get overflow when we exceed 32,767, and we get underflow when we go below negative 32,768. For floating point numbers, it's a different story. Rather than overflow, a floating point operation that should return a result larger than the greatest possible value instead returns a special value plus infinity. Likewise, a floating point operation that should return a result lesser than the smallest possible value instead returns a special value negative infinity. Actually, the floating point story is more complicated than this because of rounding and precision issues, but we won't discuss those details here. Suffice it to say that you should be careful when dealing with values at the extremities of the number type ranges. And in case you ever need to do math with arbitrary precision, the Go standard library provides a package called math slash big for that purpose. Also understand that Go is serious about these number types all being separate types. You might think we should be able to assign this int32 variable bar to the int64 variable foo because all int32 values fit in the range of an int64, but Go will reject this assignment. To satisfy the compiler, we have to explicitly convert the int32 value to an int64, and only then is the assignment allowed. Similarly, we cannot perform arithmetic on two values of different types. Instead, we must explicitly convert the two values to a matching type. Here we must get the int64 equivalent of bar if we want to add bar to foo. When converting from an int32 to an int64, the value is preserved, but in some conversions, the value may end up distorted. When converting from an int to a uint8, for example, many int values do not fit in range of a uint8, and so the converted value won't necessarily be the same. Here, converting the int value 500 to uint8 produces the value 244 by truncating the int down to its least significant 8 bits. When declaring number variables, understand that number literals themselves do not have any particular type, and so can be used in assignments to any kind of number. However, when a variable's type is inferred from a number literal, integer literals default to int, and floating point literals default to float64. Lastly, be clear that int is always a different type than int32 or int64, even when an int has the same underlying representation. As far as the compiler is concerned, they are different sorts of things. Go function definitions should look quite familiar. 
The only difference from JavaScript here is that we write func instead of function. Unlike in JavaScript, however, this function foo can only be called with zero arguments, and because foo doesn't specify any return type, it cannot return anything. In contrast, this version of function foo takes two parameters, a string and a boolean, and returns an int. Whereas a function in dynamic languages like JavaScript can return different kinds of values, a function in a static language like Go has to declare what kind of value it returns. Having declared this function foo to return an int, the compiler will object if we attempt to return a string or some other kind of value. Likewise, the compiler will complain if we attempt to call this function with the wrong types of arguments or the wrong number of arguments. Even when we pass to a function values from variables or values returned by function calls, the compiler will know if the types match the function parameters because all variables have a declared type and all functions have a declared return type. A unique feature of Go is that functions can be declared to return more than one value. Here the function foo returns both an int and a string. When we call this function, the returned int is assigned to a, and the returned string is assigned to b. Multi-return functions cannot be called where a single value is expected. So the call here is invalid because the context expects just a single number. Often when calling a multi-return function, we don't care about all the returned values. As a convenience, underscore is a special variable name which doesn't actually get assigned any value. When you assign to underscore, the value is effectively discarded. So you can only use underscore to discard values from multiple returns. We otherwise can't use it as a variable. I mentioned earlier that Go is picky about redeclaring variables. Well, Go is less picky in this special case. Here we are effectively redeclaring the variable A in the multi-value assignment, but the compiler won't complain. To make Go code look prettier and less cluttered, Go allows us to leave most semicolons implicit. What happens is that the compiler will insert semicolons at the end of any line ending with a literal, an identifier, the reserved words break, continue, fall through, and return, the increment and decrement operators, and the end delimiters, which are end parentheses, end curly brace, and end square brackets. Note that the Go spec considers types like int and float64 to be identifiers, so the compiler will insert semicolons after those words when they're at the end of a line. In this example, the compiler will insert four semicolons one after the number literal 3, one after the end curly brace, and two after these end parentheses. Perhaps surprisingly, the grammar of Go actually does expect a semicolon after a function declaration, we just usually never see it because we leave it implicit. In this case, the compiler will insert three semicolons, two after the end parentheses, and one after the end curly brace. The semicolon insertion rules effectively prevent us from formatting our code in certain ways. For example, putting our opening curly braces on their own line will cause semicolons to be inserted in places where the compiler doesn't want them. Another oddity of Go syntax is that it allows you to put a comma after the last argument to a function. This is useful when we spread a function call onto multiple lines because then a comma after the last argument will prevent insertion of an unwanted semicolon. Here we declare variable a to be an array of four ints. Unlike in JavaScript, arrays in Go have a fixed size that must be specified upon creation, and a single array can only hold values of one type. So here when we assign a string to index 3 of this array of ints, the compiler will complain that we are assigning the wrong type. Likewise, we'll get an error if we attempt to assign to an out-of-bounds index. In this case, because the out-of-bounds index is specified by constant, the compiler will catch the error. If we specify the out-of-bounds index with a variable, however, the error will not be caught until the assignment is attempted at runtime. Also understand that the size of each array must be known at compile time, and so we can specify array sizes only with constants, not with variables or other expressions that can be evaluated only at runtime. Here we create another variable which is an array of four ints. Assigning array A to array B copies all of the values of A to B. Understand that the variables here are themselves arrays. They store the values directly. This is different from JavaScript, where every variable is merely a reference to some object elsewhere in memory. In JavaScript, assigning A to B would make A and B both reference the same array object. But here in Go, A and B are always two separate arrays with separate values. To assign one array to the other, they of course must be the same type. For example, an array of view ints is not the same as an array of ints, so this assignment is illegal. The size of an array is an integral part of its type, so an array of 3 ints is not the same type as an array of 4 ints. 
Here the function foo takes as argument an array of four ints and in the function assigns to the first index of the array. Be clear, however, that the array A is copied to B and so modifications of B don't affect A. They are two separate arrays. Given any type in the language, we can make an array of it, even other arrays. So here we have an array of two arrays of three ints, a so-called multidimensional array. Again, unlike JavaScript, the arrays are fixed in size, and so we cannot assign the indexes out of bounds. Also unlike JavaScript, the elements of an array in Go are always stored contiguously in memory. If we have an array of arrays, that means we have multiple arrays stored next to each other in memory. Here, for example, is what an array of two arrays of three ints looks like in memory. And here's what an array of two arrays of three arrays of two ints looks like in memory. However, the elements of an array are not always directly contiguous. In some cases, the compiler will put unused bytes of padding in between elements of an array so that the elements better align to four and eight byte boundaries, effectively trading away memory efficiency for better processing efficiency. A slice is a type that references arrays. Each slice value has three components, an address of some array, a number indicating length, and a number indicating capacity. The distinction between length and capacity will make clear shortly. When we create an uninitialized slice variable, the address, length, and capacity all start out zero. Attempting to access elements of the slice will result in runtime errors because the slice doesn't have any actual storage. To give the slice a non-zero length and capacity, we use a special built-in function, make. The first argument to make is not an expression, but rather the type of slice to create. So in fact, this built-in function isn't really a function. It doesn't take an expression argument. It doesn't take a value. It's a special syntax that takes a type specification. It's not an ordinary kind of function. The second argument specifies the length, and the third argument specifies the capacity. This call to make here will create an array of eight ints somewhere in memory, and then return a new slice value, which references that new array. This assignment here effectively copies that returned slice value to variable A. Now that we have a non-zero length slice, we can use it like an array. However, even though the array pointed to in the slice has an actual capacity of eight, the slice only has a length of five, and so indexes five and above are considered out of bounds. Now, if we create a second slice of ints, variable B, we can assign A to B, but be clear that this only copies the slice value, not the array referenced by the slice because A and B both reference the same underlying array, accessing indexes through either A or B accesses the same storage. Here, assigning eight to index zero of A also effectively assigns eight to index zero of B. Slices with different lengths and capacities are still considered the same type, and so we can assign slice B to slice A here and vice versa. Slices with different underlying types, however, are not considered the same type. This slice of ints is not the same type as a slice of strings, and so we cannot assign one variable to the other. When a function takes a slice parameter, what the parameter receives is a copy of the slice value, not the underlying array. So here, when we pass a slice to function foo, the parameter b points to the same underlying array as a, and so this assignment to the slice in foo affects a. The first index of a now has the value negative seven. The built-in append function takes a slice and returns a new slice in which values have been added past the length of the original. If the new values fit in the capacity of the slice's existing array, the new slice uses the same existing array. If the new values exceed the capacity of the existing array, the new slice gets a new larger array with the values of the original array copied over. Here the slice a has a length of three but a capacity of five. When we append the values seven and eight to a, the array shared by the original slice and the new one now has the values 0, 0, 0, 7, and 8. However, slice A still has a length of 3, and so if we attempt to access index 3 of slice A, we get a runtime out of bounds error. If we subsequently append the values 11 and 12 to A, we get a third slice sharing the same underlying array, which now has the values 0, 0, 0, 11, and 12. If instead we were to append three values, 11, 12, and 13, the append function will return a slice with a new, larger array with the values 0, 0, 0, 11, 12, and 13. When append creates a new, larger array, it copies the existing values from the original array. 
So if we assign 20 to index 0 of A before the second append, the new array will have the values 20, 0, 0, 11, 12, and 13. To get the length and capacity of a slice, we use the built-in functions len and cap. Again, an uninitialized slice has a length and capacity of 0. If we append to a 0 slice, we get a non-zero slice with the appended values. When a pen creates a new larger array, it sometimes chooses to make an array larger than is needed for the new values. For example, the new slice created by a pen here might have a capacity larger than two. A pen does this as an optimization. If we append to an array once, we'll likely append to it again, and so allocating extra space may make future appends cheaper if they can use existing arrays rather than creating new ones. When using the subscript operator, the square brackets, we can put inside two numbers separated by a colon. This is the range operator, which returns a new slice rather than a single value. Here, a subscript 3 colon 7 returns a new slice which represents indexes 3 up to, but not including, 7 of the original slice. So this new slice has a length of 4. The capacity of the new slice is 12 because it runs from index 3 to the end of the underlying array, which has a size of 15. Understand that the new slice shares the same underlying array as the original, but the indexes are skewed. Index 0 of the new slice is the same as index 3 of the original, index 1 of the new slice is the same as index 4 of the original, index 2 of the new slice is the same as index 5 of the original, and index 3 of the new slice is the same as index 6 of the original. So here the assignment to index 0 of the new slice effectively modifies index 3 of the original, and assignment to index 2 of the new slice effectively modifies index 5 of the original. We can use this range operator to create new slices from arrays as well as other slices. The new slice here points to the array, but with an offset of 3. If we omit the number on the left side of the colon, it defaults to 0. If we omit the number on the right side of the colon, it defaults to the length of the original slice or array. So if we omit both numbers and just write a colon, we're creating a new slice that covers the whole length. When used on a slice, this is the same as if we just copied the slice by assignment, but for an array, it conveniently gets us a slice representing the array. Like with any other type in the language, we can create arrays of slices. Here we have an array of three slices of strings. The slices all start out as zero slices, so we assign them each a non-zero slice created with make. After these assignments here, the first slice references an array of five strings, the second slice references an array of 80 strings, and the third slice references an array of 30 strings. Just like we can create an array of any type, we can create slices of any type, including slices of arrays. Here we have a slice of arrays of three strings. When we use make to create a slice of arrays of three strings with a capacity of five, the underlying array is then an array of five arrays of three strings. Likewise, if we make a slice of arrays of three arrays of six strings, and we give that slice a capacity of five, the slice points to an array of five arrays of three arrays of six strings. In many languages, all local variables are allocated on the call stack rather than the heap. In JavaScript, only closure variables are allocated on the heap because they must live beyond the function calls in which they are created. What's different in Go is that local variables aren't all just references the way they are in JavaScript. An int variable in Go directly stores an int, and an array variable directly stores an array. Some Go types, however, like slices, do reference other parts of memory. Therefore, we might encounter situations like this one. The function foo returns a slice which references the local array of ints a. If a were allocated on the stack, the return slice would reference memory that has gone out of scope and all sorts of bad things might happen. The Go compiler avoids this problem by performing escape analysis. When the compiler detects cases where a variable might live beyond the scope in which it gets created, the compiler allocates the variables on the heap rather than the stack. You might ask why the compiler doesn't simply allocate everything on the heap. Well, stack allocations are generally more efficient. The stack doesn't require garbage collection, and data on the stack is relatively tightly packed, reducing the need for jumping around in memory and thereby triggering cache misses. Much like JavaScript, Go allows us to create anonymous functions. Here inside the function bar, we create a variable f to be of type func with two int parameters and returning int. 
We can then assign to f an anonymous function with that same signature, and having done so, we can then call f as a function. Understand that a function signature, its parameter types and return types, is an integral part of the function's type. Attempting to assign a function to f with a different signature triggers a compilation error. Like with other variable declarations, the type of f can be inferred from its initialization. You might assume that we can declare inner functions with names, as we can in JavaScript, but Go does not allow this. Like in JavaScript, we can immediately invoke anonymous functions. Here the function isn't stored in a variable, but rather just called, and its return value is returned from the outer function. Functions can also be used as return types and parameter types. Here, bar returns a function taking two int parameters and returning an int. We assign the returned function to a variable x and then invoke x with the arguments 3 and 7. If we want to use the returned function only once, we can just directly invoke the returned function without first assigning it to a variable. Like in JavaScript, an inner function can retain access to local variables from enclosing scopes. Here, for example, bar returns a function which retains access to the local variable a of bar. So when we invoke this returned function multiple times, the same variable a is used for each call. If we call bar a second time, we get back a function with the same code, but with a separate variable a. So calls to x and y here are using a different variable a. A variadic function is a function that takes a variable number of arguments. In Go, the last parameter of a function can be a slice specially denoted by three dots instead of square brackets. The arguments for this parameter are zero or more elements, which get passed as a slice. Here, for example, the last parameter b is a slice of strings denoted with three dots. When calling the function, we pass zero or more strings at the end, and these arguments become the values of the slice. If a function returns multiple values, the function can be used to provide arguments to a variadic function if the return values all match the expected type. Here we're calling foo with four strings, the first three returned from the call to bar. Code in Go is organized into namespaces called packages. Each package is known by a name, usually a short single word, and an import path. The import path can be any sequence of characters, but by convention, the import path should be a URL pointing to a Git or Mercurial repository containing the source files of the package. By convention, the last part of the import path matches the package name. Here, for example, we have a package named foo with the import path github.com slash brian slash foo. When you install the Go tools on your system, you should set an environment variable go path to a desired working directory. In the GoPath directory, package source directories live under a directory named src. So, for example, if on Windows my GoPath is set to c colon slash go code, then the source files for a package with import path github.com slash brian slash foo, c colon slash go code slash source slash github.com slash brian slash foo. In a package directory, each source file should end in the extension .go, but the compiler otherwise doesn't care what we call the source files. At the top of each source file, we put a package statement naming the package, and after the package statement, we put one or more import statements naming the import paths of the other packages we wish to use in that source file. For reasons of compiling efficiency and imposing clean code structure, Go does not allow package imports to be circular. For example, if package A imports package B, then package B must not import A. When compiling a package, it's more efficient if all the other packages it imports are already separately compiled. Circular imports would create situations where that isn't the case, and so they are not allowed. When using elements from an imported package, we prefix the elements' names with their package name and a dot. So if we want to use x from imported package foo, we write foo.x. Only names starting with an uppercase letter are public, meaning visible to other packages, so anything you want to expose to other packages should begin with an uppercase letter. Here, finally, is the Hello World program written in Go. A compiled Go program starts execution by invoking the function named main in a package named main. To print a standard output, we use the function print line from the format package, spelled fmt. Notice that the import path of the fmt package is simply fmt. For convenience, the standard library packages have short import paths like this. Your own packages, though, should follow the convention of using repo URLs for the import paths. 
At the top level of code, you can only have these statements, package, import, var, const, func, and type. All other kinds of statements can only be used inside functions. A source file's package statement must precede all other statements, and the imports all come second after the package statement. In general, Go doesn't care about the ordering of the rest of your statements, except in some cases your global var statements, as we'll discuss later. Looking now at how a real-world Go program is structured, here's the GitHub page for an NES emulator written in Go. The main package has the import path, github.com slash fogelman slash NES, and the two other packages of the program, NES and UI, have import paths that are subdirectories of the main directory. The project also includes one other subdirectory for a utility program that can test the validity of ROM files. Because that package is compiled as a separate program, it too must have the name main. Again, understand that the names of the source files beyond the extension .go does not matter, and how we split our code into separate files within a package also does not matter. Those all are simply matters of stylistic choice. Also understand that each import is visible only in the individual file. If you want to use an imported package in every file of another package, you'll have to import it in each of those files. By default, an imported package is known by its name, but you can choose a different name. This is useful when a package name is too verbose to type, or when it conflicts with some other name. Here, the NES package is imported with the conveniently short name N. Each package can have a special function init for doing any setup work which the package needs to do. If the package has a main function, the init function will always run first. When a package is imported by another, the compiler guarantees that the imported package is completely initialized before the local package. Global variables can be initialized by arbitrary expressions, even expressions that use other global variables of the package. Here, for example, the initial value of A depends upon the initial value of B, and the initial value of B depends upon the initial value of C, even though A is declared before B and B is declared before C. The compiler will figure out the appropriate execution order here, so we can write these declarations in any order. Whatever that may be, the variable initializations always run before the optional init function. In some cases, the compiler actually cannot sort out the order of global variable initializations because doing so is logically impossible. Here, for example, the relationship between the variables is circular. A depends upon the value of B, B depends upon the value of C, and C depends upon the value of A. The compiler will first complain that it can't infer the types of these variables, but even if we explicitly declare the types, the compiler will then complain that initialization goes in a loop. Also watch out for cases where the order of global variable initializations depends upon the order in which they are written in the file. Here, both A and B are initialized by calls to foo, a function which increments and returns global variable C. First, the variable C gets its initial value, then A is initialized by a call to foo, and last, B is initialized by a second call to foo. Even though C is initially given the value 2, after the two calls to foo, it will have the value 8. With the reserved words type and struct, short for structure, we can define new data types that are composed of other types. Here we define a struct named cat, which has three components, a string called name, an int called lives, and a float32 called age. More commonly, we would write a struct this way, with the fields each on a separate line and the semicolons left implicit. Having defined the struct type, we can create variables of type cat. We then access the individual fields with a dot operator, much like we do with object properties in JavaScript. Be clear, however, that unlike JavaScript objects, structs in Go have a fixed set of fields. We can't, say, assign to a weight field of our cat because cat values have no such field. In memory, a cat value directly contains all of its fields, so in a sense our cat variable is a variable containing other variables. We can create a cat value by putting curly braces after the name cat with name value pairs for every field. The order in which we write the fields does not matter to the compiler. Any fields we leave out will default to their zero value. If we specify just values with no names, the names are inferred from their order in the struct definition. Like with any other type in the language, we can create arrays and slices of structs. Here we create an array of three cats. We then access the first cat in the array and assign to its field lives. Here we create a slice of five cats and, again, access the first cat of the slice and assign to its field lives. A struct may contain a slice of other structs of the same type. Here we've given cat a slice of cat's field called children. 
What we cannot do, however, is create a struct that directly contains itself as a field. This leads to a logical impossibility. Any cat we create would have to be infinitely large in size because every cat would contain another cat ad infinitum. Note the key difference here. A struct directly containing its own type or an array of its own type will be infinitely recursive. In contrast, a struct containing a slice of its own type is not infinitely recursive because slices can be empty. What Go calls a map is Go's closest analog to what JavaScript calls an object. Unlike JavaScript objects though, the keys of a map in Go needn't be strings, and a single map may only store keys of one type and values of one type. Like slices, a map value is merely a reference to some actual storage elsewhere in memory. Here we create a variable x, which references maps with string keys and int values, but the variable x itself initially references no actual map data structure. We use the built-in make function to create a map data structure of a particular type and then assign its reference to a variable. Here, the variable is assigned the reference to a new empty map with string keys and int values. To create and modify key value pairs on a map, we use the subscript operator just as we do with arrays. If we assign to a key already present in the map, the assignment modifies the value of the existing key. If we assign to a key not already present in the map, a new key value pair is created. When retrieving values, if the specified key isn't present in the map, we get a zero value. Here, for example, the map of X has no key Franklin, so zero is assigned to A. To distinguish between cases where a key is not present and cases where the key is present but its value is actually zero, we use multi-value assignment. The value retrieved is assigned to the first variable and a Boolean value indicating whether the key is present in the map is assigned to the second. So here A will be assigned zero and B will be assigned false because the key Franklin is not present in the map of X. Because map variables are really just references, the parameter of the function foo here receives a reference to the same map data structure referenced by variable X. So when we add a key value pair to the parameters map, the same key value pair is accessible via variable X. So far, we've only seen maps with string keys and int values, but the keys and values may be any types, with three exceptions. Slices, maps, and functions may not be map keys. Everything else, though, is fair game, including arrays and structs. The reason for this restriction is that map keys need to be comparable, preferably with good efficiency. With functions, it's not clear what a comparison would mean. Would two anonymous functions with different closure variables be considered equal? With slices and maps, we can reasonably define what it means for them to be equal, but comparing them for equality would potentially be very inefficient. Fortunately, using functions, slices, and maps as keys is probably not something we would commonly want to do anyway. Lastly, just like with every other type in the language, we can make arrays and slices of maps. Here we have a slice of maps of strings to ints, an array of three maps of strings to ints, and a slice of arrays of three maps of strings to ints. Go has a near equivalent of JavaScript's foreign loops called for range. Given an array or slice, we can conveniently loop over the elements with for range. In each iteration, the variable i here receives an index, and v receives the actual value at that index. So this loop will print first 0a, then 1b, then 2c, then 3d, and lastly 4e. If we only need the index, we can assign to just one variable. If though we want just the values, we assign to two variables but use underscore to discard the index. Four range loops also work with maps. Here the variable k receives the key and variable v receives the value. The order in which four range iterates through the key value pairs is random because maps do not have a sense of ordering amongst their elements. If we only want the keys, we can assign to just one variable. And if we just want the values, we assign to two variables but use underscore to discard the key. A pointer is a data type that represents the address of a variable, a struct field, or an element of an array or slice. The variable y here is declared as a pointer to int, signified by the asterisk preceding int. To get the pointer value representing the address of the int variable x, we use the address operator ampersand. To access the value at the address represented by a pointer, we use the dereference operator asterisk. Here, dereferencing y gets us 5, the current value of x. If we subsequently modify the value of x and then dereference y, we get the updated value of x. We can also modify the value at the address represented by a pointer using the dereference operator as the target of assignment. 
Here we assign 7 to the dereference of y, and because y currently points to x, we are effectively assigning to x. Like slices and other reference types, pointers can create scenarios where local variables of a function may outlive the call in which they are created. Again, the compiler uses escape analysis to detect such scenarios and allocates local variables on the heap as needed. Here, for example, a pointer to the local int variable i is returned from the function, and so variable i will be allocated on the heap rather than the stack. When we pass a pointer to a function, the pointer itself is copied, not the data to which it points. So here, using dereference to modify the value pointed to by parameter p will have an effect outside the function. If we pass a pointer to this int variable i to foo, the value of i gets incremented by 3. Likewise, if a function receives a pointer to a struct, we can modify the values of the pointed to struct in our function. A special thing about pointers to structs is that we can access the fields of a pointed to struct with an implicit dereference. Here, where we decrement c.lives, c is a cat pointer rather than an actual cat, but go is implicitly dereferencing c. We could make the dereference explicit ourselves, but the usual style is to leave it implicit. In any case, if we create a cat variable and pass a pointer to the cat to the function, the lives field of the cat gets decremented by 1. If instead our function received the plain cat rather than a cat pointer, then the parameter would receive a copy of the cat and so would only be modifying its own copy. So in general, we use pointers when we want to pass data we want to be mutated in other functions. Another reason to use pointers is when dealing with large data. If, say, a struct type were very large, it would be inefficient to pass whole copies of the struct values into functions. If instead we use a pointer, only a single address gets copied no matter how large the thing to which it points. Be clear that we can make pointers to any kind of data type, including arrays, slices, and maps. Here, for example, our function foo receives a pointer to an array of four ints. When we pass to the function a pointer to the array nums, the function assigns three to the first element. Again, if instead the function received an actual array instead of a pointer to an array, the function would modify only its own copy. Much like we can have arrays of arrays and slices of slices, we can have pointers to pointers. They don't come up terribly often in Go programming, but they are occasionally useful, such as when we want to modify the value of a pointer variable in other functions. Here's a quite contrived example. We have two int variables i and j, and we want to create a function that can assign to int pointer k the address of the variable with the largest value. We'll call the function max, and it takes two pointers to ints called a and b, and also a pointer to pointer to int called p. First max compares the values pointed to by a and b, and if a is larger, a is assigned to the dereference of p, otherwise b is assigned to the dereference of p. Be clear that because p is a pointer to pointer to int, dereferencing p gets us a pointer to int. So here when we pass the references of i, j, and k to max, the pointer to i or j will get assigned to k, depending upon which points to the larger value. 5 is of course greater than 3, so j points to the greater value, and so max assigns a pointer to j to k. Lastly about pointers, earlier we mentioned that structs cannot be recursive. A cat struct cannot directly contain other cats, because then each cat would recursively contain an infinite number of other cats. With pointers, we can get around this problem. Here, the mother field is now a pointer to another cat, rather than a cat itself, and so the cat type is still finite in size. A type statement can be used not just to create new structs, but also to define names for other existing types. Here we create a type Amy, which is simply a string, a type Brett, which is a slice of ints, and a type Carol, which is a function taking int and byte parameters and returning an int. Types created with type statements are called named types, in contrast to the unnamed types like int, string, pointers, arrays, etc. We can initialize variables of named types with appropriate literals, as we do here, assigning Amy a string high, because an Amy value is really just a string. Understand, though, that the compiler considers named types to be distinct from their underlying types, and Amy value is not a kind of string or vice versa. However, because the underlying types are the same, we can explicitly convert between these two. What Go calls a method is a kind of function in which one parameter is passed in a special way. This parameter is called the receiver, and it is denoted in parentheses before the name of the function. Here, the method foo has a receiver c of type cat, another parameter a of type int, and the method returns an int. In the body, we return the product of a and c.lives. 
To call a method, the receiver is placed not in the parentheses, but instead before a dot in the method name. Here we create a cat x and then call its foo method with the argument 3. This is, of course, nothing we couldn't accomplish with just an ordinary function, but the real significance of methods will be revealed when we talk about interfaces. In any case, do understand that each receiver type has its own namespace of methods separate from other receiver types and separate from the package namespace. So in a single package, I could define a method foo on the cat type, another method foo on a dog type, and an ordinary function foo. To avoid confusing scenarios in which a type is given conflicting method definitions in separate packages, Go only allows us to give methods to types defined in the same package. Here we'll get a compile error because we cannot define a method on this type dog imported from another package. Another restriction is that we can only define methods on named types and pointers to named types. For example, a slice of cats is not a named type, and a pointer to pointers of cats is not the same thing as a pointer to cats, so these are not permitted methods. As a convenience, when we define a method on a named type, the method is also implicitly declared on pointers to that type. So the compiler will object here that we're redeclaring the method foo on pointer to cat because we've already defined the method on plain cat. These implicit declarations also work the other way. Declaring a method on a pointer type implicitly declares that method on the type pointed to. Now, when we invoke these implicit methods, the compiler passes the appropriate type expected as receiver of the method. So here, where the method foo is declared on cat, calling foo via the pointer p passes the cat value pointed to by p rather than the pointer p itself. Conversely, when the method foo is explicitly declared on pointers to cats, calling foo via the cat c passes to the method a pointer to c rather than c itself. Having introduced methods, we can now talk about interfaces. An interface is simply a list of method names along with their parameter and return types, but without any specified receiver types. This interface x, for example, lists two methods, foo with an int parameter and returning an int, and bar with no parameters and no return type. If we then define both of these methods on a receiver type, such as cat, then that type is automatically considered to implement the interface. It doesn't matter in which packages we define the interface or the type and its methods, as long as the type implements all methods of an interface anywhere in the program, that type implements the interface. Because cat implements interface x, we can assign cat values to variables of type x. Through this x variable, we can invoke any method of x, and because x holds a cat value, these method calls invoke the methods defined on cat. Imagine though that some other type dog also implements interface x. In this code, depending upon the return value of isTuesday, x will be assigned either a cat or dog, and that determines whether this calls the foo of cat or the foo of dog. Be clear that the compiler doesn't know what concrete type x will hold at runtime. The compiler only knows that x has a method foo. Which actual method foo gets called is only determined once the call is made at runtime. In memory, an interface variable is comprised of two parts, an address of the value it stores, and an address of the method table of that value's type. When x.foo is called, x holds either the address of the method table of dog or the address of the method table of cat, and that address determines which actual method foo gets called. We said earlier that every method you define also implicitly creates a matching method for the corresponding pointer or non-pointer type. For pointer types, these implicit methods do satisfy interfaces, but for non-pointer types, they do not. Here, for example, our interface x again has two methods, foo and bar. We explicitly define foo for cat and explicitly define bar for pointer to cat. This means we have an implicit method foo for pointer to cat and an implicit method bar for cat. Neither cat nor pointer to cat satisfy interface x explicitly, but pointer to cat does satisfy x implicitly. So we can assign a pointer to cat value to an x variable, but we cannot assign a plain cat value to an x variable. The rationale behind this asymmetrical rule is that in certain scenarios it helps avoid potential errors, but I won't describe the details here. Interface variables are special in that they can reference values of different types. With a type assertion, we can test whether an interface variable currently references a particular type of value, and if so, retrieve the value as that type. Here, interface x is implemented by cat, but as far as the compiler is concerned, the parameter x of the function might reference any kind of value that implements x. 
If we want to test at runtime whether the variable x references a cat and then use the value as a cat, we use a type assertion. After x and dot, we write the type we wish to assert in parentheses. This assertion returns two values, the first a cat and the second a boolean. If the variable x actually does reference a cat, then the first variable will be assigned that cat and the boolean variable will be assigned true. If the variable x does not reference a cat, then the first variable will be assigned a cat zero value and the boolean value will be assigned false. So in the first branch of our if else here, c will have a meaningful value, but in the second branch, c will just have a zero value. In a situation where we're confident that an interface variable will for sure have a particular concrete type, we might decide to use a type assertion that returns only one value. In this form, there is no boolean returned, only a value of the specified type. However, if the interface variable doesn't actually reference a value of that type, then the type assertion triggers a runtime error. Consequently, this kind of type assertion should be used with caution. The special empty interface has no methods, but empty interface variables can reference any other kind of value. Here we have an empty interface variable i, and we can assign it numbers, strings, structs, pointers, anything. For an example of how the empty interface might be useful, the print line function introduced earlier is defined as a variadic function taking any number of empty interface arguments. In other words, the print line function takes arguments of any type. Inside the function body, print line uses type assertions and the standard library reflect package, which we'll discuss later, to discover the actual types of the arguments and then print those values to standard output. If we want to do different things with an interface variable depending upon the actual type it holds, we can use type assertions with if-else ladders, but a type switch expresses the same logic more concisely. Here the value referenced by empty interface variable i gets assigned to v, but the type of v varies in the different cases. If i references a string, the first case will execute, and in that case the variable v is of type string. If i references either an int32 or an int64, the second case will execute, and in that case the variable v is of the empty interface type. If i references a cat, the third case will execute, and in that case the variable v is of type cat. If i references a value of some other type other than string int32, int64, or cat, then the default case is executed, and in that case variable v is of the empty interface type. So in cases specifying just one type, the variable will have that type, but in cases specifying more than one type, and in the default case, the variable will have the original interface type. For another example, here we want to switch on a variable of the x interface type, which is implemented by cat, dog, bird, and hamster. In the dog case, v is a dog. In the bird and hamster case, v is an x. In the cat case, v is a cat. And in the default case, v is an x. When a switch case specifies a type not implemented by the interface, then the variable can't possibly hold that kind of value, and so we'll get a compile error. Here, int does not implement x, and so the compiler knows this case would never be executed. As a minor convenience, we can automatically include all of the method signatures of one interface into another by name. Here, for example, all the method signatures of interface x are embedded in interface y. This has the exact same effect as if we were to simply write all the same method signatures of x directly in y. We can do a similar thing with structs, but with further reaching consequences. Here, the struct animal is embedded in cat, such that cat has an animal field named animal, but the fields of the animal field are themselves accessible directly. Here, for example, we create a cat and assign 4.6 to the weight field of its animal field, but we can also access this same weight field directly as a field of the cat itself. A struct can also directly invoke the methods of its embedded types. Here we can invoke the foo method of the cat's animal field directly via the cat itself. Be clear, though, that animal is the receiver in the method call, not the cat. If, however, we define a method foo for cat itself, then c.foo invokes foo of cat, not animal. A struct also effectively implements the interfaces of its embedded types. Here, animal implements x, and so cat also implements x. Because cat does not itself have a method foo, the call here invokes foo of animal. Again, if we give cat its own method foo, then that is the foo that will get invoked. Lastly, we can also embed interfaces in structs. Here, interface x is embedded in cat, such that cats have an x field of the same name. If animal implements x, we can assign an animal to this field. Calling the interface's methods is effectively the same as calling them via the x field. 
Also, because cat embeds x, cat itself is considered to implement x. If though cat itself directly implements the methods of x, then these method calls invoke foo of cat, not the foo of the value referenced by its x field. We've already seen a few type conversions, such as converting from a float32 to an int. Here exactly are the seven cases in which we can convert a value x to type t. First, if value x is assignable to type t, then we can convert x to t. Here, for example, a string is assignable to an empty interface value, and so we convert a string to an empty interface, though in this example the explicit conversion is unnecessary. Second, if value x and type t have the same underlying type, then we can convert x to t. This type myInt has the underlying type int, and so we can convert between myInts and ints. Third, if value x and type t are pointer types pointing to the same underlying type, then we can convert x to t. Here, we can convert a pointer to myInt into a pointer to int, because myInt and int are the same underlying type. Fourth, if value x and type t are both integer floating point types, then we can convert x to t. Here we convert an int to float32. Understand that in some of these number conversions, the value cannot be converted with perfect accuracy. Converting an int64 to an int32, for example, may require truncating the value because int32 has a much smaller range. Fifth, if value x and type t are both complex types, then we can convert x to t. Here we create complex numbers with the built-in function complex. a is assigned a complex 128 and b is assigned a complex 64. In the last line, we convert the complex 64 to a complex 128 value. Sixth, if x is an integer, or a slice of bytes, or a slice of runes, and if t is a string or equivalent of a string, then we can convert x to t. Here we assign to a a slice of bytes with the values 65, 66, and 67, and we assign to b the int 90. If we convert the slice of bytes to a string, we get a string where each character corresponds to the character codes in the slice. In Unicode, 65 is uppercase A, 66 is uppercase B, and 67 is uppercase C. When we convert the int to a my string, we get a single character string in which the character corresponds to the character code. In Unicode, 90 is lowercase a. Lastly, if value x is a string and t is a slice of bytes or a slice of runes, then we can convert x to t. Here, the string s has six characters. When we convert this string to a slice of bytes, the slice has 8 bytes because the diamond symbol is represented by 3 bytes, while the rest of the characters are each represented by a single byte. When we convert the string to a slice of runes, the slice has 6 runes because each rune is 4 bytes, enough to store any Unicode character. The default value of an interface variable is a special value called nil, which is a loose analog of JavaScript's null. Here, this empty interface variable i has the value nil until we assign it some other value. Nil is also the default value of pointers. Here, the pointer to int variable j has the value nil until we assign it the address of int variable k. Zero value slices test equal to nil, and in fact, we cannot test slices for equality with any value other than nil. The same is true for maps. We cannot test this map variable A for equality with map variable B, even though they both reference maps of the same type. The only thing we can test a map for equality with is nil. String variables, on the other hand, can never be nil. The default value of a string variable is an empty string. Here we have a function bark, which infinitely repeats printing a string, pausing each time for a specified duration. The function uses a standard library time package, which defines a type called duration, which is actually just an int64 signifying a number of nanoseconds. The time function sleep blocks the calling thread for the specified duration. Because of how scheduling works though, no guarantee can be made that the thread will resume execution immediately after the exact amount of time passes. It is guaranteed, however, that the thread will sleep for at least as long as specified. In our main function now, we'll call the bark function twice, first with the string marco, second with the string polo. The time package constant called second represents the number of nanoseconds in a second, and so we multiply time.second by 2 to get a duration equal to 2 seconds, and we multiply time.second by 3 to get a duration equal to 3 seconds. The first call to bark here is executed by a go statement, meaning it will run in a new separate thread called a go routine. 
Unlike conventional threads, Go routines are not managed by the operating system, but instead managed by the Go runtime. The Go runtime itself manages a pool of actual operating system threads and orchestrates how the Go routines take turns running in those threads. The primary benefit of this arrangement is that each Go routine has less overhead than a conventional thread. Whereas spawning hundreds and thousands of conventional threads is very costly, spawning that many Go routines is relatively reasonable. It's also very convenient that Go lets us spawn a separate thread simply by calling a function in a Go statement rather than having to use a complex API, as is typical in other languages. Anyway, because the first call to bark here runs in a separate thread, the main thread will continue on to the second call to bark. The end result is that we'll see Marco printed every two seconds, interleaved with Polo printed every three seconds. Because thread scheduling is inexact and indeterminate, the pauses may sometimes be longer than the specified two and three seconds. However, they will never be shorter than two and three seconds. It's also indeterminate whether Marco or Polo will print first because when a Go statement is executed, the new thread may not start executing immediately before execution continues onto the next line after the Go statement. In my test runs of this program, Polo always printed first. Be clear though that your code logic should not depend upon the tendencies of the thread scheduler. These tendencies are just that, mere tendencies, not consistent guarantees. A common pattern with Go statements is to use an anonymous function which gets immediately called. Effectively, whatever business we put in the anonymous function gets executed in a new separate Go routine. When the main thread of a program finishes execution, the program ends regardless if any other Go routines are still running. Here, the main function simply spawns another Go routine that prints a message, but most likely the program will exit before the Go routine even starts running, and so the message probably won't get printed. To help coordinate threads, Go provides what it calls channels. A channel is a data type with just two operations, send and receive, aka write and read. When one thread sends a value to a channel, that thread blocks until another thread receives a value from that same channel. Conversely, when a thread receives from a channel when there is no value waiting to be sent on the channel, the thread will block until some other thread sends on that same channel. Each channel has a designated type that it sends. Here, we create a channel of ints variable called ch. A channel variable itself is actually just a reference to a channel. To create an actual channel, we use the make function. Having created a channel of ints, we then spawn off a Go routine which uses the receive operator, a unary prefix operator that looks like an arrow, to receive from the channel. Back in the main thread, we then send to the channel using the send operator, which also looks like an arrow, but is a binary operator placed between the channel on its left and the value to send on its right. Because the send and receive operations are in separate threads, we can't say for certain which operation will be reached first, but whichever one does will block until a value can be sent and received. So this code will send the value three on the channel and print it in the receiving thread. Be clear that a single channel can only send and receive values of a particular type. Here, if we attempt to send a string on our channel of ints, the compiler will object. If we want to send strings on a channel, we need a channel of strings like so. Because the send and receive operations cause the thread to block, it's very possible for them to put our program in deadlock. Here, for example, if we send to the channel before spawning the other thread, there will be no other thread to receive the value, and so our main thread will never get unblocked. One nicety of Go routines is that the runtime can detect when all threads are blocking and will then terminate the program with an error message, which is much more preferable than the program mysteriously hanging forever. Just like with arrays, slices, and pointers, we can make channels of any type, and we can make arrays, slices, and pointers of channels. Here, for example, we have B, a pointer to a channel of strings, C, an array of three channels of strings, D, a slice of channel of strings, and E, a channel of pointers to slices of strings. We can even have channels of channels, like F here, a channel of channels of strings. It's possible for multiple threads to all be blocked waiting to receive on the same channel. Here, for example, these two Go routines wait to receive a value from the channel. You might assume that whichever thread has been waiting longest will get priority when a value is sent on the channel, but Go makes no such guarantee. Here, either one of these Go routines might receive the value 3 sent from the main thread. Likewise, when multiple threads are waiting to send on a channel, the thread which waits the longest is not guaranteed to get priority when a value is read from the channel. So here, either one of these threads might send its value on the channel before the other. However, to avoid threads getting stuck waiting for too long, the runtime does attempt to prioritize longer waiting threads, 
but again, no guarantee is made that the longest waiting thread always gets the next turn to send or receive. When creating a channel with make, we can give the channel a buffer in which to store values. As long as the channel has space in its buffer, send operations will not block because the value will be stored in the buffer. And as long as a channel has values sitting in its buffer, receive operations will not block because a value can be taken immediately from the buffer. Only when a channel's buffer is full will send operations block, and only when the buffer is empty will receive operations block. Just like with unbuffered channels, the order in which block threads will send or receive on a buffered channel is effectively random. However, the buffer itself is first in first out, meaning that a receiver will always take the longest sitting value in the buffer. In other words, whatever goes in the buffer first comes out first. Just understand that when multiple threads are blocked waiting to send or receive on a buffered channel, they are waiting to add or remove from the buffer. So the buffer is first in first out, but sending and receiving on the channel itself is not. In any case, in this example, our buffered channel can store up to five ints, and in the Go routine, we send in order the numbers zero through nine. Meanwhile, our main thread, after sleeping for three seconds, will receive from the channel 10 times. So the receiving is delayed a few seconds after the sending thread, but the buffer has space for five ints. Therefore, the sending thread will not block until it attempts to send the sixth number, because only after five numbers have been sent will the channel's buffer be full. Then when the main thread starts receiving, space becomes available in the buffer, and so the sending thread can resume sending the remaining numbers. Now, how exactly the remaining sends get interleaved among the receives depends partly upon how the threads get scheduled, which again is effectively random from our perspective. Don't assume that the two threads will always take turns adding and removing a single number on the channel. More likely, the receiving thread will take a few numbers before the receiving thread next has a chance to send more, and vice versa. When the sending thread unblocks, it may put more than one number on the channel. Whether a channel has a buffer and the size of that buffer are not a part of the channel's type, so here we can assign any channel of ints to this variable A. For the sake of avoiding accidental misuses of channels, Go allows us to create unidirectional receive-only and send-only channel variables. Be clear, a channel itself is always bidirectional. Only channel variables may be unidirectional. Here we assign a channel to both a receive-only channel variable R and a send-only channel variable S. Both variables reference the same channel, but if we attempt to send via the receive-only variable or receive via the send-only variable, the compiler will object. The compiler will also object if we attempt to assign unidirectional channel variables to bidirectional channel variables or to unidirectional channel variables going in the opposite way. So here, we cannot assign R or S to B, and we cannot assign R or S to each other. Even with explicit conversions, we cannot assign a unidirectional channel variable to any variable which is not the same kind of unidirectional channel variable. Here we see unidirectional channel variables used correctly. Both variables reference the same channel, but one thread only uses the receive-only channel variable, and the other thread only uses the send-only channel variable. In this example, both threads have access to both variables, but in more realistic examples, we would arrange for the threads to have only the single unidirectional channel variable which they need, thereby ensuring that these threads only send on that channel or receive on that channel. When we call the built-in function close on the channel, all subsequent reads from that channel will never block, and will return a zero value. Here, our Go routine reads and prints values from the channel in an infinite loop. Meanwhile, in our main thread, we send the numbers zero through four on the channel and then close the channel. Consequently, the Go routine will print zero through four and then keep printing the number zero forever. Because we might send zero values on still open channels, we sometimes want an unambiguous way to determine if a channel has really been closed or not. For that purpose, we can assign a receive operation to two variables. The first variable receives the value, but the second is assigned a boolean value, indicating whether the channel is still open. Here, we have modified our Go routine to check the status of the channel. Once the channel is closed, the Go routine will receive the values zero and false, and so we will break from the loop. Effectively, then, this code will print only zero through four, and then quit. As a convenience, we can use a for range loop to read values from a channel until it is closed. So again, this code will print only zero through four, and then quit. When a select statement is executed, only one of its cases is executed. Each case specifies a send or receive operation on a channel, and the executed case is selected at random among the cases with channels that are ready. 
If none of the channels are ready, the select will block until one channel becomes ready. If the select has a default case, the default case will run if none of the channels are ready. With select and default, we can effectively send or receive from a channel without blocking if it isn't ready. As we'll discuss later, Go has a panic mechanism somewhat similar to JavaScript's exceptions, but the primary way to deal with errors in Go is with multiple returns. By convention, many functions that need to signal error conditions do so by returning one or more values where the last value indicates whether an error occurred and the nature of that error. Error values are usually of the error interface type, which is defined as a built-in. Types implementing error have a single method also called error, which returns a string describing what went wrong. For example, the standard library package OS has a function open which opens a file. If the file opens successfully, the second return value of open is nil. If something goes wrong, however, open returns an interface error value, which we should always check immediately after calling open. For many kinds of errors, all that our program can reasonably do in the event of such an error is log what happened and abort. A defer statement allows us to queue up function calls that run only once the enclosing function returns. This can be useful when cleaning up resources like files. Here, we open a file, check that the file opens successfully, and if so, then do stuff with the file before finally closing it once finished. A problem with this arrangement, though, is that errors might occur as we work with the file, and so we might end up returning from the function early before closing the file. We can fix this by putting the close in a defer immediately after checking that the file opens successfully. Now, if we have to return early while using the file, the file will still always get closed because when execution leaves a function, the deferred calls run in the reverse order in which they were deferred. So upon exiting, this function will print purple, then yellow, then orange. Understand though that only defer statements which execute actually queue up a function call. Here, the second defer will be skipped over, and so the function when exiting will print just purple, then orange. Instead of exceptions, Go has panic. A runtime error, like accessing an out-of-bounds index of a slice, causes the thread to panic. A panicking thread will start backing through its call stack, executing the deferred function calls along the way. Here, we've deferred print line calls before triggering a panic. As soon as the thread starts panicking, normal execution stops and the deferred functions run, so this will print first orange, then red. Here, only the first print line call is deferred before the panic, so only black is printed. When a panic backs all the way out of any thread, the whole program will terminate. Here, the program will terminate if a panic propagates out of any of these four function calls. As a panicking thread executes deferred calls, we can stop the panic by calling the built-in function recover. Here, the call to foo will panic, but because a deferred call in foo calls recover, the function which called foo will itself execute as normal. A peculiar thing about recover is that it only stops the panic if it is called directly in the deferred call. Here, even if function ack calls recover, the panic will continue. Nor will recover stop a panic if we defer a call to recover itself. We can only stop a panic by calling recover directly in a deferred call to some other function. I believe the reasons for these limitations are not technical, but prescriptive. Calls to recover shouldn't be hidden in a deep nest of calls, and when recovering, we need to do more than just call recover, so these rules discourage bad uses of recover. When calling recover, make sure you do so in a defer that gets executed before the panic you're looking to stop. Here, the panic occurs before the defer statement, and so recover will not run. When a panic is triggered, the panic can be given an error value indicating the cause of the panic, and calls to recover will return this value. Here, when recovering, we print out the error. When a function recovers from a panic, it by default returns zero values. Here, foo recovers from panic, and so it returns zero. If we want to return non-zero values from a recovered function, we need what are called return parameters. A return parameter is a local variable whose value is implicitly returned by any return statement that doesn't specify values. Here, foo's return type int has a return parameter r. This return statement specifies no value, so it implicitly returns the value of r, which we previously set to 5. Inside a deferred call, we can't directly return from the enclosing function, but we can set its return parameters and thereby determine what it returns. 
So here, if our function foo recovers from a panic, we can use a return parameter to have the recovered call return something other than zero.